St. Gerard had to run away from home to join the Redemptress. While he was crawling out the window, his mother spotted him. She cried out, Where are you going? What are you doing? St. Gerard shouted back, Mother, I'm going away to be a saint. I'm going away to be a saint. And as we all know, he did just that. What are we doing here? Are we becoming saints? Isn't that just exactly why God has placed each one of us in this world? What are we doing here? Today we're going to talk about the religious life as an excellent way of becoming a saint. But before we get going, let's remind ourselves that the basic demands of sanctifying grace are the same for all Catholics. If we die with sanctifying grace, we can live in heaven. If we die without sanctifying grace, we can't, which means that we'll go to hell. There's only one reality, and that's it. So on a basic level, the life of grace is the same for all Catholics. What's different is that Catholics in different states of life use somewhat different means to preserve and foster and live that life of grace, okay? Now, we've already considered holy matrimony as one way of becoming holy and getting to heaven. In the future, we'll also consider the single state and the priesthood. But today, we'll take a quick look at the religious life. We'll start with a quick definition. Then we'll consider the religious life in the light of the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. Then we'll consider how we can tell whether a particular religious institution is safe to enter in these disastrous times. And finally, we'll consider just who is called to the religious life. Okay? So here's a traditional definition of religious life. Quote, Religious life is a form of life approved by the church wherein some of the faithful joined into society establish themselves in order to tend to perfection by means of the three vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience which they make according to a rule. Close quote. So that gives us a general idea. Religious belong to church-approved societies They're governed by a rule. They have the goal of striving towards perfection, and they do that by means of the three vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Okay? Now let's take a look at the religious life in the light of faith, hope, and charity. And to do this, we'll rely heavily on that great Carmelite, Cardinal Anastasius of the Holy Rosary. Now cut and splice quotes as needed for the sake of time. The light of faith. Cardinal Anastasius, quote, The religious life has the characteristic of exalting the supremacy of God. The religious soul recognizes God and recognizing him as the absolute draws the consequences that I belong to him, must belong only to him who is attracted to me and who has rights over me. Such certainty comes from faith and in the strength of faith the soul realizes that it must be entirely given to God. The religious lives for God alone, in God alone, with God alone, and is happy to give witness by his life to the supremacy of the Lord. Close quote. Once we see this reality that God is everything, and that we're just proud dust, that he's holding and being, holding just above the surface of nothingness, once we see that reality with the eyes of faith, it's easy to understand the idea of consecrated life, the kind of life that religious lead. Quote, If God is God, then the religious soul feels that its life must be given over exclusively to his service as a total offering of self to God, being absolutely at his disposal, consumed in praise of his glory and in recognition of his divinity. Faith throws one down on one's face in the dust, before the majesty of God and lifts one up to consecration, union with God, jealous for his honor and proud to be at his service right to the end. Close quote. Now once we see that the religious reacts to the absolute supremacy of God by his profound submission, 
then it's easy for us to understand the vow of obedience. Quote, Obedience depends upon faith. Why is a religious obedient? Not because the superior is always right, but because he represents God. Obedience is a recognition of the supremacy of God. In his vow of obedience, the religious not only says to God, I recognize your authority, which is something common and indispensable to all Christians, but he also says to him, I recognize your liberty to express your authority as you please in the person or form that you choose. Religious obedience, then, is an attitude of adoration, of consecration to God, close quote. And it's also easy for us to understand the significance of the gospel in the life of a religious. Quote, the gospel and the religious life are the fountain and the spray. The gospel is the font of all consecrated life. All that we have is there. The gospel is the story of God become our own. And we are in religion because we believe that God is ours. It is a story of humanity returning to God, and we are religious so as to return to God. Here is the story of a mystery that is accomplished so that God may have all the glory that belongs to him. And man, through this glory, may have all the happiness for which he was created. We express these things in religious life so that we will be ruled by God, and so that the world will believe and love him, and finding him again, regain the homeland, close quote. So what have we seen with respect to the virtue of faith in the religious life? We've seen that the religious reacts to the almighty supremacy of God by submission. The submission leads logically to consecration, to the vow of obedience, and to the centrality of the gospel. The life of hope. Now to understand the life of hope, we need to keep in mind what we've already seen, the central idea, this profound conviction that God alone matters. God alone counts. God alone is of value. God alone is all. Quote, One seeks the religious life with the conviction that in this and through this way, God will be attained more securely and more profoundly. The desire and search for God is typical of the religious life and in reality is an expression of hope. Unlike others who sanctify themselves through their secular professions, the religious is, by profession, one who searches for God and looks to eternal life. Close quote. And a logical consequence of this profound orientation towards God, towards eternal life, is to make a decisive break with the things of this world. Quote, the religious abandons everything in order to follow God alone. He says goodbye to the world, not as one who makes a sacrifice, but as one finally turned towards freedom, with the spirit of one who is convinced of being privileged, even if nature feels the burden of separation. Close quote. The religious abandons everything in order to follow God alone, not as one who makes a sacrifice, but as one finally turned towards freedom. Quote, the religious life involves every kind of detachment. One leaves homeland, family, wealth, profession, friends, culture, habit, attitudes, everything. All that roots and locates a man must be left, given up. Why? Not just as a penance and a sacrifice, but as an expression of hope. Total renunciation in the religious life is the logical consequence of the certainty of hope. God alone counts. God alone is of value. God alone is all. So we do not renounce with sorrow, thinking that what we leave behind is more than what we seek. But we renounce with joy. It is true that the things left behind are often in themselves beautiful and good. The religious does not renounce beautiful and good things because he does not appreciate them, but he renounces them because of the light of theological hope. Everything here below loses its value. Close quote. And once we understand that the religious is inspired by this profound hope in God to joyfully abandon everything to follow him, once we understand that, 
then it's easy for us to understand the vow of poverty. Quote, by the vow of poverty, the religious burns his bridges and disarms himself. He abandons his life completely to God, leaving obedience to take care of every need. This gesture, which the world cannot understand, would seem madness if it were not justified by an immense hope, an intimate conviction that God is enough and more than enough. It means living to the letter, the words of the gospel, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his justice, and all these things shall be added unto you. Thus, the religious places himself in the hands of God as a son in his father's house, expecting everything from him, ready to recognize that everything God gives is his gift, and everything that he does not give is not necessary, notwithstanding all appearances to the contrary. Close quote. So what have we seen with respect to the virtue of hope in the life of the religious? We've seen the religious is filled with an immense hope, a profound conviction that in this state of life and through this state of life, God, the God who is enough and more than enough, will be attained more securely. And so the religious is inspired to renounce everything in order to follow God alone, not as a sacrifice, but as his final turn towards freedom. And that leads to vile poverty. Life of charity. The ultimate motive for the religious life is found in the virtue of charity. The love of God. Loving God above all things because he's all good and worthy of all love. Quote, God loves us and we love him. In order that this love may be our whole life, we become religious. The religious life is one of an undivided heart and will. The soul wants God alone and expresses this desire for an undivided love, not admitting any rival, any other presence that, than what is of God or for God. Total love is his vocation. He feels it. He says to God, I love you alone. Close quote. Of course, this idea of a lover putting his true love first and not allowing anyone else to intrude in that relationship, that idea should be familiar to all of us. It's the same idea as the vow that a man and a woman make when they get married, when they promise to forsake all others. Once we understand that, then it's easy for us to understand the vow of chastity. Quote, the virtue of charity leads to the vow of chastity. Such a vow, like those of obedience and poverty, is not made to put the accent on renunciation and sacrifice, but to put it on the totality of belonging, of love, and of dedication, so that God may be truly the exclusive and total love of one's life. The vow of chastity then does not consist in something negative. It consists in a choice, a positive preference of the one unique and infinite love. Renunciation, even if at times it is burdensome, is a consequence that does not deserve to be emphasized. So great is the importance of the positive aspect of the vow. Close quote. And just like every other love affair, this love pours itself out. First in contemplation of the loved one, and then in action that expresses that love. Quote, the religious life expresses love for God, even in its external works and occupations. If a religious is working or employed in any form of activity, the explicit formal motive is charity. No matter what the form of religious life, it is governed in every respect by charity. Close quote, Cardinal Anastasius of the Holy Rosary. So what have we seen with respect to the virtue of charity in the life of the religious? We've seen the primary motive for religious life is the love of God. We've seen that the religious wants an undivided love of God with no rivals, and that this total dedication and desire for God alone logically leads to the vow of chastity. Okay, we've taken a quick look at the definition of religious life. We've considered religious life in the light of faith, hope, and charity. Now let's quickly consider how we can tell if a particular religious congregation is safe to enter in these disastrous times. Look for five things. First, is the union with the Holy Father. Second, has a true devotion to our Lord, the Most Blessed Sacrament. Three, true devotion to Mary. Four, they wear their habit. 
5, they keep their rule. It's on union with the Pope, devoted to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, true devotion to Mary, where they have it, keep the rule. Okay, now let's quickly consider just who is called. For this section, we'll rely on St. Thomas. But before we deal with this question, there's a very important caution for parents. Now, you've heard that before from here. Parents, this is one place your authority does not extend. St. Thomas, St. Bernard, St. Alphonsus, all doctors of the church, all point out that it is a mortal sin for parents to try to dissuade their children from following a vocation. Okay. So who are called? A good number of you are sitting out there wondering, do I have a calling to the religious life? Well, don't start by trying to figure it out by looking inside yourself. That's not how it works. Don't expect some little voice, some kind of private revelation. That's putting God to the test. That's asking for trouble. Remember that little voices inside don't always come from heaven. Don't look inside yourself. This is the most common error. Don't look inside yourself. It isn't a big puzzle thing where you're looking around, searching through your memory. That's not how it works. Okay, Father, if we don't look inside ourselves, then how do I know if I have a calling to the religious life? If you have a generous soul, a balanced personality, if you're relatively physically fit, if you're out of debt, then start by asking yourself, what am I doing here? I only have one life to lead. Am I becoming a saint? Be brutally honest with yourself. You only have one life to lead. Am I becoming a saint? Now, consider advantages of this state in life. That great talk to the church, St. Bernard, list them for us. St. Bernard says a religious life is, quote, a holy state in which a man lives more purely, falls more rarely, rises more speedily, walks more cautiously, receives the showers of grace more frequently, rests more securely, dies more confidently, passes through purgatory more quickly, and is rewarded more abundantly in heaven. Close quote. St. Bernard. Okay, consider those advantages. Now, then, don't look inside yourself and listen up. How do you know if you have a calling to the religious life? It's easy. God is calling. God is always calling generous, bold souls. God is always calling souls that dare to give themselves completely to him. God is always saying to you, come and follow me. Don't look inside yourself for some small voice. All that's required is the desire to be a saint and the firm will to follow through. You don't have to be holy already as long as you have upright morals and a delicate conscience. The purpose of entering a religious congregation is to become holy. All that's required is the desire to become a saint and the firm will to follow through. God is always calling generous, bold souls. God is calling you. All you that have a firm desire to become a saint and the will to fall through. If you have a generous soul and a balanced personality, you're relatively physically fit, out of debt, all is required is a desire to become a saint and a firm will to fall through. God's calling you. St. Thomas says there's no need for long deliberation about whether or not you ought to go. Because in itself, the religious state is a better way of life. Don't delay discussing this with your confessor. Make sure it's a good confessor that thinks with the church. Keep it a secret. Don't talk to anyone. This includes your parents and family. Don't talk to them without the permission of a good confessor or your spiritual director. Keep it a secret. St. Thomas says, quote, It is better to enter religion with the purpose of making a trial than to not enter at all. Close quote. All that's required is a desire to become a saint and a firm will to follow through. God is calling you. Let's close with a meditation by Father Manelli. Quote, If you want a vocation of the consecrated life because you do not have one, 
turn to Our Lady. Of course, we should never pray, Lord, if the favor I ask you does not suit your plans, please change them. But a person's desire for this noble favor and appreciation of its value may be a grace indicating that God wants to hear him and grant him the vocation as something intended for him from all eternity to be acquired in this way. If you already have this vocation and simply want to perfectly preserve it and fulfill it, then entrust it to Our Lady. If you're in danger of losing it, appeal at once to her. She will even work miracles to preserve this gift of God for you, provided that you hasten to her with childlike trust and affection. You may then hope that she will enable you to reach paradise by way of her own path, namely, consecration of God. God is calling you. Don't delay. Let's kneel down and pray Our Lady will inspire many vocations to the religious life from our communities and our families. In the name of God, the Son of God.